Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Rank 10 Yu-Gi-Oh! where we rank 10 cards. The topic of today's video will be a monster subtype that was around ever since the old Legend of Blue Eyes, Flip Monsters. The sneaky little assholes that exist for the sole purpose of letting you know that no attacking is safe. They weren't exactly treated as a separate subtype until a few years ago, but they sure as hell were useful way before that. Before we start, I just need to point out that this list won't cover monsters whose effects activate when they're flipped face up, only monsters where the FLIP effect is specified in all caps. So enough with the chit chat and let's head on to number 10. This is a card most of you should be very familiar with because I think it found its place in absolutely everything Yu-Gi-Oh related ever, Man Eater Bug. Its flip effect is pretty simple. Target and destroy one monster on the field, or as the original print likes to say, destroy one monster on the field regardless of position. Wow! Anyway, this is a card that is obviously being power creeped away from, both in terms of effect and artwork, but two things are undeniable. This was one of the very few monster removal options available in Legend of Blue Eyes, and it caused extreme rage in countless little children when they ran into it over and over and over again. Yes, Man Eater Bug gave many of us post-traumatic card game disorder, and I feel it deserves a spot just for the rage factor alone. I spy with my little eye on number 9, something beginning with Gravekeeper's Spy. Okay, that was bad, but this card is anything but bad. First of all, it's a 2000 defense wall that can special summon another Gravekeeper monster upon getting flipped, so obviously you'd run it in Gravekeeper decks, right? Ironically, this card was initially ran absolutely everywhere else. Back in the year of 2005-ish, there weren't many options to go into beaters above 2000 attack early on in the game, and the monster that could summon another 2k wall from the deck that can also serve as a tribute fodder was a fantastic stalling option. It also saw a bit of play in some teledead variants, and naturally it works great in gravekeepers, being able to special summon monsters from the deck. Not much else to say here, it's just a really good card. At number 8 rolls in Death Koala. Yes, I understand this is like the third card from a billion years ago, but due to this little shit's constant poking when playing against burn decks, I felt it deserved a spot. Upon getting flipped, it simply inflicts 400 damage to your opponent for each card in their hand. That may not sound like much at first, but you must realize that people who play burn decks, as in people who have no shame or self-respect whatsoever, will go as far as running three of these, along with using Book of Moon and Book of Eclipse just so they could poke you again for 8 to 1600 damage per flip. Typically, it's just my luck that one time I happened to have a slifer with 25,000 attack on the field, I attacked into Desco and lost 10,000 life points. And yeah, usually you won't have 25 cards in your hand for Death Koala to take a shit on your face, but its burn effect is just annoying enough to warrant a spot. A shocking decision at number 7 is Battery Man Microcell. Released in a time when Battery Man were a very niche archetype that came down to 80% brick and 20% OTK, Microcell was there merely to slightly boost their consistency, but upon the release of Battery Man 9V, the brick to OTK ratio got basically swapped and Microcell was a fantastic tool of setting up your field for massive damage. The common strategy is to get your Microcell flipped on your opponent's turn, special summon 9V, search out another 9V, normal summon him next turn, and search out Fuel Cell, and you have at least 6000 damage on board. Or on your turn, special summon 9V, search out Charger, tribute Microcell for Charger, special summon Fuel Cell from anywhere, you get the point. Microcell might not directly harm the opponent, but it's a switch they should definitely not press unless they're ready for the onslaught it can unleash. At number 6 we have the most adorable little puppy, Raiko Lightsworn Hunter. Initially I thought of putting Magical Merchant on this spot, but then it hit me. Nobody fucking plays Magical Merchant. On the other hand, Raiko is very much played both in Lightsworns and in various decks that focus on self-milling. Upon getting flipped it can destroy one card in the field, and then mill three cards from your deck. The first effect is great as it offers some quick destruction removal of any card on the field, and obviously the second one immensely helps Lightsorns as these guys just love dumping their entire deck in the graveyard. There's not much else really to say here, it's just a neat card for any deck that focuses on self-milling. Oh, and by the way, did you know Lightsorns had another flip effect monster? We don't talk about that one though. At number 5 is yet another classic, MOTHERFUCKING PENGUIN SOLDIER! This guy's old as shit, but that doesn't stop him from wrecking your weak ass beyond repair. You got Dante and Virgil, all big deal back to the fucking extra deck they go. Oh shit, is that a Brian Ack and a Valkyrus? Not anymore, bitch, flip face up and back to the hand they go! Penguin Soldier! Newt Newt, motherfucker! Ah, 
Ahem, at number 4 we have the spooky Shadow Falco. Obviously a Shadow monster had to get a spot on the list considering it's an archetype based on flip effect monsters, and Falco upon flipping allows you to special summon a Shadow monster from the graveyard in face down defense position. It doesn't do anything directly, but it enables you to reuse powerful effects such as Shadow Beast, Squamada and Dragon all after they were sent to the graveyard. Plus it's also a tuner, although the ability to go into synchros with this guy isn't nearly as impressive as his quad categorization. Spellcaster Flip Tuner Effect. Hmm, so a Pendulum re-release would look something like this, probably? Ew, it hurts my eyes. Although I wouldn't take out the possibility that Konami would make something like this, considering Odai's Rebellion Dragon is very much a thing. Milling its way to number 3 is the infamous Needleworm, one of the best deck destruction cards in the game, beside Ghost Trick Skeleton and Exchange of the Spirit. This tiny little thing sends the top 5 cards of your opponent's deck to the graveyard. True, most modern decks don't really care about getting their shit sent to the graveyard since it's basically become a second hand, but back when Needleworm was played massively, every single face down monster was a very ominous sight. If you weren't careful, you could get 15 cards just shaved right off the top of your deck. And even today there are some decks this card can be insanely useful against, especially in combination with cards such as Gravekeeper's Servant or Don Zalug. It's not exactly Skeleton Mill, but if you just wanna annoy the hell out of some people, I suggest trying out a Needleworm Mill deck. Number 2 is a card not quite available to us just yet in the TCG, but oh boy it's gonna be fun when it gets here. Bot of Taboos is basically 4 forbidden cards available to you by a flip effect. When it's flipped, you can apply the effect of one of the following cards. Pot of Greed, Giant Thrunade, Regeki and the Forceful Sentry. And yes, I realize Regeki isn't forbidden here, but it is in the OCG, so there's that explanation. So, sounds a tad broken? Well, this is circumvented by the fact that the card is level 9, probably the worst level in the game after 11, and it's limited to 1 activation per turn, so it can be that usable, right? That's why we have Prediction Princess Koinorma, and well, basically the entire Prediction Princess archetype. When she's flipped, you can special summon a level 3 or higher flip monster from your hand or deck in face down defense position, which makes part of the boost stupidly easy to bring out. So, after using Pot of Taboos once to ruin somebody's day, you ritual summon Tarot Ray and keep reusing Pot of Taboos for some hilarious non-stop advantage until people just rage quit. And that's the beauty of this card that ensures it definitely has a place at number 2. Nothing better than having instant access to the Forbidden list. Now if only it could replicate Stratos' effect. <sighs> one day... So, before we hit number 1, let's take a look at some honorable mentions. Parasite Parasite for being the only card in the game that can enter your opponent's deck, Summoner of Illusions for being the only card in the game that can summon Sandwich, and Dice Jar for potential 6000 burn to yourself or the opponent. Alright, so you can call me unfair for doing this, but I feel it would be unfair to do it any other way. The undisputed kings of flip monsters in Yu-Gi-Oh, no matter their position on the ban list, are and always will be Morphing Jar, Morphing Jar 2, Cyber Jar, Fiber Jar, Jar Jar Binks, okay, no, not that one. Morphing Jar 2 and Cyber Jar basically do the same thing. Get rid of all the monsters on the field and replace them with new ones off the top of both players' decks, which is quite a lot of power for such low-level monsters. Morphing Jar is just card destruction on steroids, and fucking Fiber Jar is basically the Sharazad of Yu-Gi-Oh! The only thing it needs is resetting both players' life points to 8000. These cards are all banned for a very good reason. This amount of hand and field clearing and, well, dual clearing that's available to a player just by a tiny flip effect monster is completely intolerable, especially today when you could benefit an insane amount from sending so many cards to the graveyard with morphing and cyber jars. And fiber jar is just a trolling mechanism, Jesus, imagine playing with three of these in a tournament. Just stall forever until you go into time. No matter what kind of removal options and draw power any other cards on this list have, none of them come even close to the power of the jars. Okay, why is he here again? Excuse me!